What's up, guys? Welcome to another Marble Cast. Today, I'm joined by National Chairman of the AAU, Martin Drake. Martin Drake has been involved in powerlifting since the 1960s. He's been doing AAU stuff forever, and he's a he was a pleasure having on here. So we hope you guys enjoy this episode. Let's check it out. All right, Martin Drake, everybody. Martin, thank you for coming on here. We appreciate your time. How are you? I'm doing fabulous. This is my, my pleasure to be on with you and your people today. Yeah, I appreciate your time. So you just uh, moved houses, huh? How did that go? Well, it went well. Um, I had, when I first moved back from California to Vegas to do, because I do some events out here, I leased a home from a friend. And she decided to take advantage of the hot market and put it up for sale. Um, and I happened to find a place. I'd like to put three houses up. So move three houses up and all set. All right. What part of California are you in? Um, I've got homes in the Newport Beach area, and then I've got homeland. Um, I have a horse ranch out there. Oh, man. How many horses do you have? That sounds awesome. Well, I'm down to zero now. At one time, we used to have a string of about 20 to 25 that we showed a lot. Showed a lot on the East Coast, a lot of showing and judging along the East Coast there, Northampton, Massachusetts, Devon, Madison Square Garden, a uh, number of places. When you say show, do you mean, is it like dressage or is it like horse racing or how does it work? Well, we show Morgan horses and side horses, very high trotting uh, very animated horses. So, yeah, pretty. Uh, let's see if I can. I see the horse in the back there. Turn it around. I'll show you. They're gonna come to you. Hang on. work <laughs> oh yeah that's a fancy horse yeah he, that was a pretty nice horse he did extremely well for us in hand is that, are, are they like a, a special breed they are that, that, that's the Morgan horse breed uh, they have been known for years for their versatility but the confirmation of them and it very much applies to any athlete um, allows them to be very vertical um, and thus be able to trot very high. Uh, it's like the confirmation of an athlete. Uh, the horses are the same way. Um, a five foot three inch uh, person doesn't usually make a very good basketball center. That is very Somebody true. Somebody <laughs> is very tall, very rangy, has a lot of reach, certainly has a lot of advantages playing basketball. Oh. It's the same in the horse breeds. If you want a horse that's going to be able to be very high stepping and very uh, animated, they have to be able to get that neck back vertically, put that weight back into a position that allows them to be able to lift their front legs. It is very, very similar to what we're going to be asking for a weight lifter, whether they're snatching or cleaning and jerking, and that is to bring that bar up into the space being as vertical as possible, and they own that space. We just come in there and use it. It's hmm. the same thing when you're showing a horse that's very upheaded. It's all about that getting tall, getting long, getting that, getting that reach Getting overhead. tall, getting long. It's exactly right. It's, so whether it, you're squatting for powerlifting, whether you are deadlifting, whether you're snatching, clean, and jerking, in order to be able to get that verticality, right you have to have it where they own that space here their confirmation has to be such that that neck is right up here it's in your lap they own that space you are behind it just a bit and it's no different and you do work with the aau right i have i've been with the aau since 1962 started uh, with them as an athlete in the sport of weightlifting uh, switched over, well, I didn't switch over, but 
did predominantly powerlifting meets from the time that the first powerlifting meet in history came out, 1964, um, and have been competing powerlifting, weightlifting, bodybuilding, strongman piece of strength since. Um, and I'm now the national chairman for all of strength sports, which covers six different sports. It covers the sports of weightlifting, powerlifting, bodybuilding, and fitness, uh, our strongman, our feet of strength, combines, and moss wrestling. So you started in 1964 powerlifting? Correct. How old were you when you started? Uh, 13. I lied about my age. Had to be 14. <laughs> oh, Yeah. All right. uh, yep, started competing then um, and have been competing since and uh, have done okay. Yeah. I'm um, blessed. I've won 49 world titles and set 490 world records. Good for you, man. That's amazing. It's been, a, it's been a joy so far. I'm looking for number 50 this year and a few more records. There you go. Uh, what, was your, your, what are your, your best numbers to date? Well... The best numbers that we show on our sites, and I'll go by the records that show on our websites. Uh, my best deadlift is the 733, um, and uh, my bench is varied all over the map, depending on uh, age. Um, I'm a five foot nine athlete with a guy six five arms, <laughs> and uh, uh, I was rolled on by a horse 47, 48 years ago, so I have 40 percent strength in my right arm. That being rolled said, on by a horse, you said? Year, by a horse, yep. Long oh, story. Um, but last year in January, um, I did a double body weight bench well for the first time, and that was at 69 years of age. So, Good for you, um, man. I spent a lot of time on technique, and technique to me is absolutely the essential ingredient for success in any of these sports to be able to get your maximum out of the lift and to keep from ever getting hurt. What do you think drew you to the sport of powerlifting? You said you were weightlifting prior to that? Yeah, I, I, I think it was that the weightlifting has a tendency to be taught, sadly, to be too technical. I, I think we overanalyze it and we have a tendency to teach it incrementally. Powerlifting had more of a raw nature to it. It's, uh, you learn just a couple of basic um, axioms and rules and put it together in a singular motion. Uh, weightlifting, like I said, we have a tendency to dissect. As I got older, I realized, well, well weightlifting doesn't need to be dissected the way people have a tendency to do it. You know, you'll hear coaches say, your first pull, your second pull, your third pull. To me, right. that's highly accurate. Yeah, I try, to take all my to, I try to take all my athletes, I try to take their head out of the game so that they don't think about the lift, they just move, because you don't really Absolutely. have time to think. Yeah. And if the athlete thinks about it being a pull that you're making that is accelerating as you're going through various regions of your body, it makes it simpler. When right. they start thinking, I've got, got to have a first, a second, a third pole. Well, in order to do that, at some point, the bar's stopping. Or at least that's how it comes out when the athlete tries to do it. Coach is not trying to get that message across. They're thinking about three segments of a pole. Right. But they uh -huh. teach it as three poles. Um, when I finally realized that weightlifting was not as complicated and convoluted as we were making it, then I thought, hey, I can come back to it. And by the time I came back to the weightlifting side, I was ancient. <laughs> and so now, uh, as an ancient lifter, we lift differently than we did when we were 11, 12, 13, 15, 18. Um, it, it's, we can do all the things. We can squat as deep as we ever were able to. Many of us still have great flexibility. It's the timing and the speed. Yeah. And I always teasingly tell people, well, once I pull that bar up and I go to descend, it's first floor, second floor. The bar's already on the ground, and I'm still trying to descend, right? And so that's why you'll see an awful lot of 
older athletes who still have mobility and flexibility really resorting to power snatches and power cleans because their speed and timing just isn't there. Yeah, it gets a little bit harder as you age to get under that bar. And the, the speed just, it goes as you get there. Yeah. You take any professional athlete and the thing that goes is speed and quickness in any sport. And typically their strength is, in, they're increasing their strength at 40. They're seven or eight years past their speed yeah. prime. Yep. I'm already feeling mine starting to go, so <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on that powerlifting train soon. But um, we we can we can help you with that one anytime. We'd love to get you going there too. I got a handful of powerlifting uh, athletes here, and uh, we we all compete in USAPL. So how USAPL different is, is a great organization? How different is USAPL to the AAU in terms of powerlifting? Well, look, can I take you back and kind of give you a little history of powerlifting? Please, if you don't mind. Please so, do. Uh, the, the sport of powerlifting was actually created by the AAU in 1964. And at that time, we were the national governing body for every sport to the Olympics. Right. Track and then and that, field, somewhere along and the line, field. they sort of got separated. Well, what happened is that in 1978, they passed something Congress did, called the National Sports Act. And in that, they said, for each individual Olympic sport, you must have an NGB, which is a national governing body. And it can't be under one organization, which is what we were prior to that time. So we created USA Track and Field, USA Boxing, USA Basketball, USA Weightlifting, et cetera, out of our memberships. And there was a certain transition period. USA Powerlifting is not an NGB. And US, the title USA Powerlifting is really a DBA, or they are the American Drug Free Powerlifting Association. And they were established in 1982 by Brother Bennett. Um, so in, 96, in 1978, our AAU, when they were reforming, said there are certain sports we might divest ourselves of. One of them for a while was powerlifting. We created an organization called the United States Powerlifting Federation. Don't see much of them around for a while, but they were pretty dominant. And they... Oops, we lost connection again. Still here? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm here. Now you're frozen. Yeah, my, my thing says internet connection is unstable. Hold on. Holding. You hear me? I hear you, yeah. Right, so I think we're back. Um, in 1972, we created an international organization called the International Powerlifting Federation, the IPS. Um, and so... In 1978, USPF became part of the IPF, and then they had a falling out in 1997, and they came back and talked to various organizations such as us about being the international affiliate. We said we already are running international events, so they talked to the American Drug Free Powerlifting Association, ADFPA, and they created the DBA and became the USA Powerlifting. Uh, USA Powerlifting's mission has always been to be drug free. Our mission uh, is, upon our return was to make sure that we drug tested all the time. We came back in 1994. Uh, traditional drug testing in most strength sports, with the exception of, a, of an NGB sport, is you have a referee or somebody select somebody or they do a uh, lottery system and that referee administers the test. That test gets sent off to lab results, come back. Uh, in 1999, our organization, our parent organization said, if you're going to drug test, we want you to do it the way they do in the Olympics, which is to have a third party organization. And we went out and selected the uh, Center for Drug Free Sports, who does the NCAA, Major League Baseball, NFL, MLB, et cetera. Okay. USAPL to AAU, what are their similarities and what are their differences? The similarities are that the rules are extensively the same. Where we are different is the IPF 
dictates an awful lot of the small nuance rules that USAPL is under, uh, such as whether equipment is approved or not, uh, what your weight classes are, et cetera. So USAPL has a different set of weight classes that was established by the IPF a number of years ago, where other organizations have the heritage weight classes. Um, drug testing wise, they do predominantly, uh, their drug testing is done by their, their staff at an event. They go with a 10% uh, yeah, 10 procedure. Right. We, we have it a different way. We have our center come in and they test a number of the meats, not all of them, and, and you sign an entry form that says you are willing to be out of meat tested up to one year after your card expires with a maximum of 12 hours notice. So approximately two thirds of our testing is done out of meat. Um, two different ways to get to the same thing. The recent IPF USAPL debate is that IPF wants USAPL now to go to third party testing using USADA, which is the US Anti-Doping Association which is the organization that tests usually for um, NGBs. Right. Uh, and they are looking at that and saying, well, USADA is inordinately expensive. How can we handle that? And they're going to work that out. Uh, but we are third party tested and we are proudly at this point the only exclusively third party tested organization in the world. Uh, our international athletes typically come to our events here that we host in the United States. So we become the center for their travel and uh, we go there. We, like USAPL, uh, have single ply divisions which are diminishing significantly and we actually created the concept of RAW in 1994 and it took a very long time for other organizations to say, gee, that's a good idea. Did um, you compete equipped or did you do raw or you do both? Well, I've done both. And so um, originally um, the sport started out with you wore a singlet. A few people went to using uh, the, an ace bandage for a knee wrap. And then people came up with stronger knee wraps and then people like George Zangus from Marathon created the first squat suits, uh, and I was one of the guinea pigs for that with George. Uh, John Inzer and a number of other people created bench shirts and squat suits, heavier knee wraps. And then at some point, people in the sports said, gee, this is getting pretty interesting and a little bit different than we were looking at because they were getting 10, 20, 30 percent out of squat suits, knee wraps, and bench shirts. Well, that 30% now, in some cases, there are actually a few ventures with single five that can get almost 100% carryover. In other words, they can double. Yeah. And so in 1994, we realized that that was probably not the direction that we should be going uh, as a sport. And if we wanted to attract people and have people look at it as a sport that was not predicated on uh, how good you became at utilizing equipment, but what you could lift as your, you know, your normal self. Uh, we came up with the concept of raw, and at that time it was a singlet, belt was optional, uh, wrist wraps were optional, uh, and nothing on the knees. That eventually morphed into knee sleeves. Um, I would say probably 90 to 95 percent of our athletes today lift raw. We do not recognize an, an in-between area that some do, which they call classic raw, where you're allowed knee wraps uh, instead of knee sleeves. Yeah, and there so are a lot of that's different. USAPL are very much alike. Yeah, there are a lot of different uh, federations and different rules with powerlifting. And like you can look up, I think I could find like 30 different federations of powerlifting with there different are 34. sets of rules. Yeah, it's like hardcore yeah. raw. There's uh, drug tested, drug uh, drug 
please use drugs federations uh, don't use drugs all the time federations with knee wraps no knee wraps there's classic raw modern raw uh equipped uh, it's it's just there's so many different federations with different rules do you think that that kind of muddies the water a little bit did i lose you again i'm here you're here all right Can you hear me? i hear you okay so you were asking uh, does it muddy the waters? The answer, it does. Yeah. And to me, if people were to ask me my personal opinion, I think there are a couple of organizations that are on the right track. And I believe that is headed up by us and the USA Powerlifting. I think they are the most... Um, I, I think they offer the most, the two organizations. And USAPL is my primary competition, but I find what they do, by and large, to be very good. Um, there are other organizations that are out there. Um, you have 100% uh, owned by a friend of mine, Paul Bossi. He used to be our North Carolina State Chairman. Um, there are a number of other organizations out there, you know, I, I don't have a lot of support for. Yeah. One of the things that I think is important, the most important thing, and that's one of the things we do in AUU is make sure an athlete and his family have a good, safe environment. We are the only organization, strength sport organization, other than USA Weightlifting, or weightlifting only, uh, that does background checks on coaches. We also do a background check, which nobody else does, on all athletes 20 and over. And we are the only strength sport organization for the sports of powerlifting, uh, bodybuilding, et cetera, that provide an athlete insurance. So if you were to happen to get hurt at an AAU event, God forbid, we will take care of your medical bills. Um, if you have insurance already, it becomes supplemental. I, I think those kind of discriminators are, are really important. When you want to go to have an environment that you believe is safe for the athletes, safe for the family, um, and so uh, the organizations that don't say, I'm part drug-free, I'm part not drug-free, uh, yeah, we take care of the athletes, but we don't provide any insurance. Yes, we take care of the meat promoters, but we don't provide uh, liability insurance. I, I question those concepts. There are some organizations that do a very good job of it, many of them sadly don't well i think uh, some of the athletes are expected to have their own insurance in case something happens to them uh at competitions or even training so if something happens at a aau event aau you have to fill out a form with the whoever the director the meet director is and then Correct. they they go over what happens and you just stay in contact how does that work a absolutely and so as the person goes to the doctor and their doctor bills come in and let's say they have no insurance whatsoever, right? Or there's insurance lap. Our insurance pays up to $100,000 per occurrence, okay? So okay. if you broke your ankle in 2019 and 2021, you tore a peck. That's per occurrence. Uh, if you already have an 80-20, we would be paying the 20%. If you've got a good policy, but you've got any other out of pocket, it becomes a supplemental. Um, the thing of it is, there's two organizations that are in strength sports that provide something like that for their own events. USA Weightlifting, as an NGB, must do that, but it, it covers them only for USA Weightlifting events. Okay. AU, it covers you as a AAU adult for any strength sports of the six sports that we have, as a youth for any sport that you participate in of the 41 sports. We take it a step further. Let's say, Joe, that you uh, buy an extended benefits membership, and our memberships are only $24. And most organizations are $65 to $100 for each sport. So we're $24 for you to be able to compete in six sports. 
but you pay $3.50 more for what we call extended benefits. You get hurt training, you're covered. If you get hurt at some other organization's event, you are covered by AAU. So if I go so, to a so. weightlifting competition and I get hurt, but I have AAU extended benefits membership, I'm covered by AAU. Correct. 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 Nice. So as we always tell, there, there are some organizations that admonish their members for competing. Oops. Right Are you there. Now, we, we're hoping, Seth, we're unstable. Hold on one second. Okay. We hope that, you know, you do as many of your events with us. But wherever you go, we want to make sure you're safe. So when people do AAU events, can they qualify for Olympic level competitions or next level weightlifting no, they, or IPF? Or is... So let, let, let's define that. Okay. Can they qualify today to go to an IWF or IOC sanctioned event? The answer is no, because we are not the NGB. Okay. Now. IWF and weightlifting is in a tenuous situation right now anyway with the IOC. And there has been a situation where they've been on the edge of being reduced as an IOC sport for quite a while. Right. Um, there are some people that think it's going to happen after 2020, some after 2024. Uh, who knows? But clearly, they've been put on notice for a number of years, right? Uh, powerlifting, there is no such thing as an Olympic sport there. And the probability that they ever will be is inordinately low. Right. Because uh, the IOC is looking for something that is much more youth oriented, much more exciting. Uh, before the pandemic, there was a group of events they were playing in San Diego called the World Beach Games. And it was sort of a prelude to what they want to see as Olympic sports, surfing and those type of events um, were important there. So things that will capture eyeballs on the screen um, will capture sponsors and have uh, a broader appeal is what the Olympics has looked for for a number of years and will as they go forward. Yeah, they're looking for marketing. <laughs> they absolutely are. And yeah. as much as I love our sports, they're, they're not easily marketable. Right. Yeah, it's not easy to watch a weightlifting event if you don't know what's going on and it's sort of over in a second. Right. You really have no idea what's happening. So that being said, we have established within our own organization a number of international events and uh, that we host. Let me turn that off. Um, ourselves and have since 1996 and uh, that's events such as we have at the world championships in Las Vegas October 20th through 22nd where we have five of our six sports going on and that's at the Paris Hotel and then we have a couple of our events that are at our national level that will be at the event that you and I have been talking about in Atlantic City where we have a powerlifting event that we are um, recognizing this year to set world records at, and our national weightlifting, which will also be an event uh, where we can set and or break AAU American and world records. And we brought on board sort of the first family of weightlifting in the Cohen family. And the Cohen family, as you're aware, were the people that created um, on their own um, the USA Masters weightlifting, which has had an affiliation but not ownership of or by USA weightlifting. And so they have been uh, able to go to master international tournaments through the uh, international masters events. Um, and they also can qualify depending on their totals for um, the American Open series of events, which in my opinion is a series of regional events, and then the 
if you that they have that ability to be an open national qualified athlete then they can also qualify for the nationals but it's a very small percentage of the masters that would ever get to that level because by the time you're 35 years of age your career as an open weightlifter at the international level is by and large gone with yeah very few exceptions Keep reminding me. I'm right there on the cusp of that 35-year mark, and I'm on my way out of the sport. <laughs> it's weightlifting. I hear you. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so, there, so having an opportunity such as USA Masters for them to be able to do weightlifting it is wonderful. And for us, we we have all age groups, and so where we have something special, we do have an IOC affiliated sanctioned and agreed upon I guess uh, event and that is the IOC has allowed us to use for many years the title Junior Olympic Games and we host that in uh, various cities around the country uh, the strength sport, sports portion of that for the near future has been moved to our other strength sports events because of equipment, et cetera. Um, but the event in August for youth, they can enter the AAU Junior Olympic Games, and we are given permission by the International Olympic Committee to use Olympic in the title. So youth athletes can compete in all of these sports in the Junior Olympic Games, weightlifting, powerlifting, uh, all strongman sports, and that's what it... In August. Right. So in the Junior Olympic Games this year, we have sports for powerlifting, weightlifting, bodybuilding. Uh, in the Open AAU Worlds, which allows also the different age groups, they can also compete in powerlifting, weightlifting, bodybuilding, fitness, moss wrestling, feats of strength, and strongman. And then we also have moved in because is the California State Games, which is part part of State Games of America, and we are hosting this year their powerlifting and weightlifting as part of that event as well. And it's open to the states that are contiguous with California or any other state that doesn't have a state games. So when people compete in these Junior Olympic Games, can they, you said they can qualify for like the AO series and the American Open finals? No, no, no. We have no relationship oh, so this, whatsoever with USA Weightlifting. So do you think that that's more of an issue of marketing for weightlifting where a, an athlete who competes in weightlifting as a junior or a youth athlete within the AAU cannot qualify for Olympic level or next level weightlifting events? Well, it, it, it's, it, to me, there, there's, you just added, asked a very loaded question. So let me take you back in the kindest way I can answer that. <laughs> Our mission, if I look at the back of my business card, it says sports forever for all. Okay. Right? Our whole thing is to provide a platform for that 4-year-old and a platform for that 94-year-old. Right. And everything in between. The charter of an NGB, whether it's USA Track and Field, USA Boxing, USA Weightlifting, is to prepare at an open level uh, for to prepare for the United States the best international teams, whether it's the Pan Ams, whether it's the uh, Worlds, whether it's the Olympic Games, through the IOC Sports. That's their charter. Along the way, they suddenly realized, well, they need a youth market. Well, we have a youth market, and we've been doing that for a while. They have redoubled their interest in that and have found now some international avenues for a small portion of those athletes. So every year, eight or ten of their kids will go to an international weightlifting event 
form for young athletes, for junior athletes, school age, whatever. Uh, Masters has gone on that path that we talked about through USA Masters into the International Masters. Okay? We want everybody of all ages to be able to experience an international event without them having to always be the most elite. Okay, so okay. there's like limited qualifying totals or there are no qualifying totals for these national events that you guys put on? It, so typically for AAU, our qualification for open master's youth has been to successfully total at a, an, an AAU event. Pandemic aside, right? Uh, this year, we are allowing athletes that haven't qualified in a while um, to compete at our higher level events because it was of no fault of their own that they didn't qualify. Um, there are people that say, well, it's way too easy to qualify for an AAU international event. And I say, guilty as charged and gladly so. Okay? And you'll hear people say, well, AAU events are just about people having a wonderful time. Absolutely guilty as charged, right? Um, do we have elite athletes? Absolutely. And we especially have master elite athletes in the sport of powerlifting, bodybuilding, etc. cetera. Um, but do we also have uh, lots of weekend warriors? You bet. We, we all are. Um, do we in any way um, place the athlete who has an elite total in a different position than the person that can barely move a bar in competition, they are to us dead easy. An NGB's role is to create those athletes that have the best um, opportunity to medal at an international uh, IOC related event. And so they do funding for them uh, et cetera. It, it's, it's a different model of what you're looking at. We're trying to make that a sport accessible to everyone. It's more of like the everyday athlete, come on out and lift and show support for the sport that you enjoy. And at the end of it, you could possibly qualify for a future bigger event. And I lost you again. <laughs> so what, can you hear me still? I can stuff. hear you a little bit. Okay, so um, you're familiar with the American Open Series? Yeah. Okay, so there used to only be an American Open. Right. And then that was in... Whoops. Low connectivity. Technical difficulties this episode. We'll figure it out, guys. We appreciate you sticking with us. Shout out to Alice, our new sponsor on Marvelcast. Thank you, Alice. We made it back. All right, you're back. Okay, so we were starting to talk American Open Series. Right. American Open Series is what we used to call the Junior Nationals. And it was originally set to figure out, okay, if you had at a Nationals, you had eight or ten in a weight class that qualified. Yeah. Because anything beyond those eight or ten, they had basically zero chance of that. Uh, American Open Series... Uh, which became three more events for the national office to run out of USA Weightlifting was a way of trying to get a lot more people to an event in a nice city, big, more glamorous event. Because right, a bigger event for people who couldn't qualify for the actual bigger events. Correct. Now, there you would have sometimes M flights on recessions. Yes. So you're talking about you'd have 200 to 250 77 kilo guys, right? With a half a dozen of them having a chance to medal. Now, um, it, does that become an elite event? Only because of the venue and because of the nice platforms in there and the numbers that made it special. We've used that model for a very long time, right? Um, but our numbers come from having a variety of different athletes there. Um, 
the USA weightlifting in the last number of years has looked to destroy their membership and they, they did it by attracting events like that. Um, prior to that, they had actually, in my opinion, had gone away from having as nice of venues. They had their senior nationals, I believe it was in 2012, in an arena that was like a roller hockey arena. Yeah, and I that think that was, was 2013. Yeah, 2013. Yeah. yeah. Um, same year, a few months later, we ran our first weightlifting nationals after bringing the sport back in a 56,000 square foot ballroom in San Diego. Um, USA Weightlifting said, we're going to up our game. You know, there are other people out there who want weightlifters, and they did. And that's when they created things like the American Open Series. I think that's wonderful because it provides athletes an opportunity to go to elite venues in fun cities and stuff like that. A model that we've been using for decades. So um, our AAU World Championships, when we host that uh, in a 30,000 square foot ballroom in the center of the strip, is kind of unique, right? We are trying to get back in there. And we are consistently in areas like that. Um, Prior to 1978, the AAU Senior uh, Weightlifting Nationals and Senior Powerlifting Nationals and Mr. America were all on network television. And we're talking about ABC, Spy World Sports, ABC, etc. And many times in prime time. Yeah. In the last 40 years, um, that hasn't been the case. Right, yeah, everything uh, changes. Yeah. And so, how do you get the sport back to being a sport that's measurable and, and meaningful? And, and, it's, and it's going to be through growing numbers, and it's for uh, taking the sport and making it back to being fun again and not being about being elite. It's about being uh, involving everybody, right? So, um, we want to encompass and embrace everybody that wants to compete. Yeah, I, I agree with that that logic because when you bring the everyday athlete who won't ever get a chance to be on that stage, it at least gives them a chance to get somewhere with the sport. Whereas if you just have the nationals or the elite level, yeah, for sure, like people will lose interest because they'll they'll basically be like, I'm never gonna get there. Why do I even bother? But now you have all these competitions and you guys are coming out to AC at the showboat, which is a, a cool venue that we're most likely going to be at. I have a handful of athletes that are going to come and throw down with you guys and uh, we'll see how it all goes. Yeah. So I think that's going to be really fun. And that's an interesting uh, foray into it for us because we have not cultivated that part of the United States in a number of years. Uh, I've been very, very selective on, who I want to run our events because I want them to be the same level of quality, as much quality as you can. Here we got a gentleman that has taken the original, we used to have the original AU Mr. America bodybuilding title that was sold. Uh, and so he brought it back, a guy named Mark Torello, and he brought it back as an unsanctioned event. Ran it last year in Atlantic City, had some fun. We've been talking about whether or not that should return to be an AAU. Mr. America to even bring up the prestige. In the meantime, we've been talking about how do we help his event grow, how do we help in the Mid-Atlantic region AAU strength sports grow, and so we brought in AAU powerlifting, and I will be out there to help Mark run that uh, on the, the 10th. And then we were looking at should we run weightlifting there, and got into a discussion with Michael Cohen um, and for those that don't know Michael, he was a 1980 Olympian, uh, the year that we boycotted, sadly. Uh, but it was a two-time Olympic coach uh, for weightlifting. And like I said, they created the USA Master Weightlifting. He very much wanted to see AAU get a rebirth in that area and has the equipment, the experience, wherewithal to bring in a good event. And so I will be out there assisting with that as well uh, and as the strength sports chairman. Um, 
we are capping the event at 200 lifters. Um, and we want to make it an event for all ages. We are not requiring qualifying totals. Um, and there's an opportunity for somebody to come in to, I think it's roughly 60,000 square feet of space between us and strongman one day and us and powerlifting, weightlifting, and our Moss Wrestling the other day. And for all the athletes that are competing in any of the sports, they also get a free ticket to the Mr. America Bodybuilding, which is being held Saturday night. So it's an opportunity for everybody to participate in a sports festival and not have to hop in a plane and fly to Vegas or Hawaii with us, um, but to be able to have it closer to their home if they are East Coast based. And right now, um, it's our first return to that area in a while, and the energy and the enthusiasm has been very high. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a mini uh, Arnold weekend that they well, run in Ohio. Is. So I'll give you history. The Arnold weekend, which came about in the late 80s, really had a predecessor. And that was in 1970, Jim Lorimer, who is Arnold's partner, was asked to put on a four television sports festival. And the centerpiece was AAU Senior National Weightlifting. And I believe we also had our powerlifting in there at the same time. And we brought in a, our AAU World Bodybuilding. And for the first time then, we had a pro division. And some young guy named Arnold Schwarzenegger won that. He beat the, the short class winner, Franco Colombo. And people like Sergio Oliva and so on were part of that. And so um, that became the first foray that I know of that Jim Lorimer did in creating a sports festival, and it was in Columbus. Uh, a number of years later, they had the concept of creating the Arnold Classic. And what the Arnold Classic did that was different than other festival-based uh, events is they brought in a broad variety of sports. Um, and the, in many cases, a broad, broad variety of organizations, as well as having an expo base. Uh, if you go to the uh, Olympia, it is primarily an NPC IFBB hosted event that brings in a few other sports. The Arnold Classic, to me, was a broader base, and it started serving the youth. So they bring in cheerleading, they bring in youth sports. Um, and it's a wonderful concept, one that we've been doing for a very long time. We just happen to house it under AAU because we, we have enough athletes there to run it. We actually have a basketball tournament in July in Vegas, believe it or not, that draws 50,000 kids. Huge and weekend. And at the same time that the Junior Olympics is going on, let's say in Houston, and at the same time we run a 45,000 kid basketball tournament in Orlando. So we are our own giant festival yeah. in many cases. Yeah, and this AC one is going to have a bunch of different sports as well. So you're going to have a huge weekend. Are people going to be able to compete in both powerlifting and weightlifting? Will they be run simultaneously? Or is it something that can be separated so you can have... Yeah, so what, we'll be, so what we're going to do is we will make sure that, that we time that. So we are the only organization that can sanction a super total. Okay, right? yeah, that's because what I was getting at. Because we have powerlifting and weightlifting under us. There are other people that will buy a card and do a XYZ power lifting meet along with a uh, USA weightlifting and do it on the same thing. Different weight classes, you know, it's a lot of different issues. Here, our weight classes went back to the heritage weight classes. So whether it's um, Atlantic City or it's Vegas, they can compete in weightlifting followed by powerlifting 
And as long as it's done over that weekend, they establish a supertotal of the five lists. That's awesome. And so we work very hard to make sure that their schedules are such that they can do both. And so, yes, there will be athletes doing both. When, you, when athletes sign up for this event, and do, is there an entry total that they have to put in so you could separate the, the heats or the sessions? Or how does that work? No. Just... We, 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 so the way we typically do it uh, at our events is we do flights or sessions, uh, depending on which sport it is, based on getting everybody that's in a certain class together, grouped together. Okay. We don't have uh, 15 flights of 77 kilo men like you have American Open, right? You'll have one maybe, right? So okay. if you have one flight of them, it's easy to put them together. Right. And so uh, at Worlds, for example, we set our schedule up where it's a known schedule. If you are a female, you're lifting on Friday. If you are male 148 and below, you're lifting on Friday. If you are male 165 to 181, you're lifting on Saturday. If you're 198 and above, you're on Sunday. Unless we move you ahead of time, right, in order for you to establish a new the athlete are, are at a disadvantage. But many athletes do that in order to get things done. So the schedules will be well known. Oh, okay. And so, so if you need to make a flight in, hotel rooms, you know what days you're lifting. Right. I know Marcy is uh, looking looking to sign up for both of them. She wanted a super total with you. I, I got to tell you, she, she is amazingly fun. I met her a couple weeks back. Her energy is boundless. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> her enthusiasm is there. Um, I want her to meet someday a young lady that we have from Australia, Valerie Silver. Valerie's uh, 70 plus years of age. She competes, she comes out to our events. She'll do all the feats of strength events, maybe 18 of them. She'll do the strongman. She'll do the powerlifting. She'll do the weightlifting. She's a human dynamo. She and Marcy, I think they separated at birth. <laughs> It could be possibly true. Wait till you actually meet Marcy in person. She's a, she's a firecracker, that one. <laughs> uh, I, that's, that's Valerie. Yep. They're, like I said, their personalities are so much alike. Well, we're looking forward to that weekend for sure. We're, it's on our calendars uh, October 8th to the 10th. Is that correct? Yeah, so the 9th and the 10th is Saturday, Sunday. Um, there are rooms available before and after that. Um, I haven't been to the show book, so it's going to be fun for me coming on in. And uh, I'm going to be the guy bouncing around doing everything because I'm going to be a good portion of time with the bodybuilding show, and then we've got the powerlifting, weightlifting, and the, and the moss wrestling. And you're familiar with the moss wrestling? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Oh, uh, it's an ancient sport out of Russia. Okay. Uh, you're familiar with the very famous strongman... Ode Hagen. Wait, is the Moss wrestling with the uh, the stick where two people are on you the... You got it. Okay, so, yeah, I know it. what it is. Okay, but explain it for anybody else who doesn't. So, so it, it, think of two athletes sitting down. They got a board that their feet's up against, and they got a stick, and they're going to fight like a dog fighting for a bone to either pull that stick out of the person's hand or to pull them over that board. Um, it is a tremendously difficult sport relative to, it, it, it tests every bit of energy you've got. Um, and then there are techniques you learn about how to move across the board to get advantage of it. Um, but it's a blast. And yeah, many times in uh, events, we'll have a lot of our high school kids that are competing in the other sports. When they get done with their powerlifting, for example, they want to do moss wrestling. Their skill levels, you know, aren't real high because they don't spend a lot of time training it, but their desires are amazing. And it's so much fun. We'll have to put a little moss wrestling uh, class in the CrossFit gym here. 
Yeah, and we, we have people that can help with that. Um, the international organization uh, is out of Russia. There, there is an organization that is predominantly run for the professional ones, which is USA Moss Wrestling, and that's headed, headed up by Ode Hagen. But Ode is also AAU Moss, and so he is pretty much taking all of the drug-tested amateur athletes and doing AAU base now. And so we are the home for that portion of the market. Um, and Ode I've known, God, we met at a bodybuilding show in 1974. Um, and as you know, he was in the World's Strongest Man contest many years. He is the, the foremost grip uh, strength athlete in history. Um, and he's part of my amazing person to get involved with. Um, and again, at all of our major events, whether it's Laughlin in April or Spring Break on the River, uh, our Worlds, um, and this event in Atlantic City, that's one of the sports available. And as a weightlifter or powerlifter, your membership card covers that as well. A lot of sports, a lot of coverage, guys. Yeah, a lot of fun. Yeah, I bet. Have you guys ever done any work with CrossFit? Trying to get in that market? So, so, yes. So, so, uh, as I'm talking to somebody that owns a CrossFit market, I'm going to be careful how I, I say this because I have many dear friends in CrossFit. The concept that CrossFit has had, which is to get a whole bunch of athletes trying a whole bunch of things, brings in typically people that want to do a variety of things. They want to do a mud run this week, they want to do a crossfit event this week, next weekend, they want to do powerlifting, they do want to do weightlifting, they want to do things because it's in their DNA, it's in their blood to try a whole bunch of different things. Right. In the time when crossfit was climbing significantly, that 2008 to 2015, 16 time frame, uh, there were a lot of organizations that were reaching out to CrossFit athletes and saying, we want more of you involved in powerlifting, weightlifting, and so on. And we, we actually, probably from 12, 2012 through about 2017, had a number of them coming in and out of the uh, powerlifting and weightlifting side. But we learned a couple of things about those athletes. One is... A small segment of them said, hey, I'd rather do that than CrossFit. And so they went into one of those there. But most CrossFit athletes didn't love CrossFit, right? And that's yeah, their you get that CrossFit home. bug. And to get them, they're, they're sporadically in and out of these sports. Uh, and we, we love having every bit of participation from them. But it's not a sustaining stable base, right? And, and it's the whole nature of what you guys like to do, which is a ton of variety. So what we're trying to let people understand is, well, we have that variety in a different format. If you want to do full Olympic weightlifting, you can do that. If you want to do full power, you can do that. If you want to do bench only, you can do that. If you want to do pull-ups, we got that in our feats of strength. If you want to push a sled, we got that in feats of strength and strongman. We got all of those things going on, um, but it's not in a CrossFit format. In the CrossFit format or functional fitness format, has been well captured by CrossFit and its affiliated organizations. The what was it? The uh, Granite Games and a few other of those um, setups really took CrossFit-like advanced functional fitness packaged and looked much like the CrossFit games. Um, ours are, we want to be able to have measurable, recordable events. And so if we're going to do a snatch or a clean and jerk, we're going to do it for the rules. If we have a complex, all of those lifts must look like the rules of an Olympic lift, right? right. Um, 
there are many of the CrossFit people that go, that's not the rule set that we enjoy as much. Right. Yeah, um, I understand that. I mean, CrossFit it, is it's its own breed. So, I mean, it's... It is absolutely weight, its own yeah. breed. Weightlifting, yeah. powerlifting are their own separate beasts to conquer. CrossFit right. and, is... And we, and we have athletes that go in and out of all of those. Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, out here in, in the Vegas area, we especially have some wonderful CrossFit gyms that have brought some tremendous athletes to our events over the years, but many of them, if given the chance of going to a local CrossFit event or an international weightlifting event, they choose that CrossFit because they are more comfortable there, right? Um, and so we, we try to make sure that, our, that when we're working, we, we understand that nuances, and those that want to come to a weightlifting event or a powerlifting event where the structure of the rules is different um, and they're comfortable with those rules, um, they have a bias. Um, now, have we ever thought of replicating a functional fitness type of event? Right, I was going to uh, ask you that. Is that something that you guys would want to do in the future is replicating some sort of CrossFit style event where it's not necessarily as crazy as the games would be? but just certain movements where you'd set parameters and simple standards where... So, so, so we, Go ahead. We, we, in, we, in essence, have that, right? So um, in, in many of the local CrossFit events, they'll have a complex of events, and one of them might be deadlift for reps, yeah. right? Um, with, with a set weight or whatever. That's all part of our feats of strength. Yeah. Pull-ups we have as parts of our feats of strength. But our pull-ups is a strict pull-up. Right. Cross we use as a kipping pull-up, right? Right. Uh, when we went to try to ensure some of the uh, events, some events were not as easily insurable. Okay? So if somebody says, well, I want to have an event that uses a wall ball, easy. Right? I want to use an event that requires strict pull-ups. No problem. Uh, power cleans for reps. We already got that. Deadlift for reps. We already got it. Bench for reps. We already got it. The difference is the rules that dictate those sub-events are typically on a stricter format. So if you're doing bench for reps, we're not allowing the head come up, the feet come up. Um, and you got full lockouts, you got three referees, not a single counter, right? Um, those are the type of things. But can we replicate a number of the functional fitness type of movements in an event? Absolutely. It, is it something that would be under, could we put under feats of strength? Absolutely. Is it insurable? Depending on the events, absolutely. So if you said, I want to run at my box an event that has these pieces and I want to put those in as a uh, scoring where you did deadlifts for reps, you pushed a sled for 25 meters, uh, you did power cleans uh, for reps in a time phase. Um, all of those are our rule books. And so, Joe, you could create that smorgasbord of we're going to use Select these six events, run it, and it's an AAU feats of strength event. I would be. But you would have to follow the stricter guidelines of the feats of strength rules. Well, we'll have to talk about that because I could definitely do that. There are a lot of moves yeah. in CrossFit that I don't want to do. <laughs> right. And yeah. so, so you design it towards the events that you think will attract for you and the events that are. Um, you know, an event that would uh, be the safest events and the most fun events you've got. You can create that. So, yeah, I, the way I look at CrossFit competitions for myself is I want it to be safe. I want it to be easy, easily judgeable. And I want it to be sort of fun. So, for me, like box jumps, deadlifts, or power cleans, uh, and even... 
I don't know, like you were saying with sled pull would be kind of fun. Like something, something you can do that and replicate that's easily judgeable and not necessarily has too much of a standard that can be confusing. That's the way I would look at it. Right. So, so in, in order for us to, we, we are records based. And so if somebody says, uh, I pushed a 50 pound sled, 50 meters, right? Uh, we'd have to understand the, there would have to be a set of rules that defines that, that's universally accepted at every AAU event. Right. If, if the box creates their own sled push, your box that didn't consult with the box down the street on a set of rules. Right. right? Um, if you look at, at a, a CrossFit event, Quite often, it's not as well defined, in my opinion, what those rules are and the limitations are until you get to a certain level, right? Um, for us, they would ha that le that definition would have to be the same at all levels. Yeah, right? so it would have to be scalable. Um, absolutely, and yep. so if we have a bench for reps, for example. Uh, the way it works for us, you lay down on the bench, you can have the handoff, take it off yourself. You have a specified weight, head flat, feet flat, thumb around the bar, and there will be somebody, the referee will say start, you bring it down, and they'll give you a press. It's not a, it's not a uh, pause, so they'll give you a press. Once it's hit that chest, you push it up full length. When you've gone to full length, you'll get a count one, and that's your down command now again. Okay, during that time, if your head comes up, that rep doesn't count. If your feet slide, that doesn't count. If everybody understands that, they're on equal footing, and you can run that. Right. If, if you, in one box, run it where, well, we had a single referee instead of three, and we didn't care if their feet moved, and this guy's doing it very strictly, it's you cannot record records and stuff. It's very difficult to do it. And when you go back, somebody gets hurt, and you go to an insurance company and say, well, how are they doing it? Did they follow what's written in the rule book? And the answer is no. You've got an issue of insurability. If the rules are all, all the same in every group, box, um, gym, does it identically? Beautifully. Then when that same person goes to the world championship and does that same sub event at a world championship, they know what to expect. So yes, we can replicate a lot of the uh, functional fitness movements because many of them are already in our pizza strength rule book. And now putting them together as, as a package, each meet director decides what they want to do there. This could be a fun project for us, Martin, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, where can people find information about this competition coming up in AC? Um, I, I'm sorry, the, the Mr. America one? The, the one with the Mr. Uh, America in Atlantic City? Yeah, the Atlantic City one. Sorry. The Atlantic City one. So the uh, powerlifting... And weightlifting and bodybuilding are all, if you go to the Mr. America website, uh, not under AU Mr. America, it's Mr. America website, they will have separate portals to the powerlifting, weightlifting uh, portions of the events. Um, the gentleman that's running the bodybuilding is actually the meet director for the powerlifting, and so his site has a direct shot to his uh, registration. The weightlifting is to a separate one, and Michael and Cheryl Cohen, who are, again, uh, from Savannah, Georgia, they are managing the weightlifting portal. Uh, I have put out on the USA, Mas I'm now on the Masters Weightlifting Forum, the non- um, uh, organization specific one that's run by Cheryl and Corrine and everybody. There is also a link out there or if they need that link 
for weightlifting and powerlifting, they can always email me at naturalpower at earthlink.net and I can point them to the right spot. All right. We're going to have a link in the description of this video and this podcast, guys. So anyone who's interested in competing for with the AAU, weightlifting, powerlifting, strongman, bodybuilding, any feats of strength, hit that link in the description. You can check all out all the information out there. And uh, Martin, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on here. It's such a joy. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity. And uh, we're going to have some fun come October. And uh, would love to get you guys involved as an AAU facility. And I think we discussed before the advantages to a gym or a box of our insurance policy with up to a $10 million liability insurance policy for 80 bucks a year. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm yeah. So that's, it's an additional thing to help you sleep at night and the athletes feel safer. It's all about so the we'd safety. Love to get you on. Are you going to yeah, compete man. in October? Uh, I'm going to bring a few people. I don't know if I'm going to compete, but uh, I know Marcy's going to try and convince me, so we'll see what happens. I, I think she should pin you right back and make sure you're out there. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But I'm looking forward to being there, Good. and we'll see you out there in Atlantic City at the showboat. Martin, thank you again for coming on here. I appreciate your time. You are so very welcome. It's been a, my distinct pleasure. Thank you very much. Guys, age is inevitable. Weakness is not. So get out there and lift some shit. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching today's Marblecast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any content. Check out our Spreadshirt shop to grab some swag. And if you would like to support the Marblecast, please head over to anchor.fm. All of the links are in the description, and it helps us out to keep the channel running. Thanks so much, guys. See you next time.